Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to the American Lung Association's Lung Cancer Patient Forum on COVID-19, brought to you by the Penn Medicine Abramson Cancer Center. Thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Christy Dernlin from the American Lung Association in Pennsylvania. I'll be your moderator this evening. On behalf of the Lung Association, we're so glad to be with you this evening to support those of you living with lung cancer and your loved ones and caregivers as we all navigate through care and concerns during the COVID-19 pandemic. We're grateful to this amazing panel of lung cancer physicians from Penn Medicine who are generously volunteering their time and medical expertise tonight. A couple of important notes. We're recording the program, not only so we can share it online, but also potentially for you to be able to use it as a reference and watch it again later. Also, please click the Q&A icon on your screen to submit questions to our panelists. We'll ask these during our Q&A session after all the presenters have spoken. So please include the name of the panelist if you're directing your question to someone in particular, if you like. Before we hear from our panelists, I'd like to take just a few minutes to tell you about the American Lung Association and our mission. Our vision is a world free of lung disease. The American Lung Association's mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. We accomplish our mission through education, advocacy, and research. And we keep our focus on four strategic imperatives. To defeat lung cancer, to champion clean air for all, to create a tobacco-free future, and to improve the quality of life for those with lung disease and their families. Now, more than ever, our work is crucial. When COVID hit, the American Lung Association took action. Our organization was formed back in 1906 when our nation was facing a tuberculosis epidemic. Today, the Lung Association is uniquely positioned to address the needs we face in fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. We adjusted our goals this spring to incorporate research, advocacy, and education to tackle COVID. We announced our commitment to a $25 million COVID-19 action initiative which includes an increase in funding our research program, including new research on COVID-19 and other emerging respiratory viruses. You may have heard about Lung Force, the American Lung Association's national initiative to defeat lung cancer. We advocate for lung cancer patients and promote lung cancer awareness. We aim to change people's minds about what it means to have lung cancer and to share the message that anyone can get lung cancer. We support research innovation that will lead to early detection for all and better treatments that give everyone a fighting chance. Some of our successes since Lung Force launched in 2014 include providing over $16 million in lung cancer research funding, helping secure a 100% increase in NIH lung cancer research funding, successfully advocating for Medicare coverage of lung cancer screenings, and supporting more than 140,000 patients and caregivers through our online resources. The Lung Force campaign includes Lung Force Expos, Walks, and our Turquoise Takeover. The Lung Force Expo is an educational event with a free seminar track for patients and their caregivers and also a track for healthcare professionals to earn continuing education credits. Right now, we're planning for a virtual Lung Force Expo next spring. Lung Force walks happen across the nation, including here in Philadelphia at Head House Square. I'm pleased to share with you that Penn Medicine sponsored the Philadelphia Lung Force Walk in May, which was a virtual event this year. And the Penn Medicine Thoracic Oncology team was our top fundraising team participating this year led by Dr. John Kaharchik. We're really thrilled for their involvement and support in all our efforts here. The turquoise takeover happens during National Women's Lung Health Week in May. During that week, we focus on public awareness about lung cancer statistics. We illuminate landmarks across the nation in turquoise, which is our signature campaign color, including Boathouse Row and Ben Franklin Bridge here in Philadelphia to bring awareness to lung cancer. 
So we hope you will consider joining with us and Lung Force as we continue the work of educating and advocating. The last thing I want to mention is the upcoming Radnor Run, a five mile race and two mile trail walk in Wayne, Pennsylvania. Like most other public events this year, the race will be a virtual event. And Penn Medicine has been a longtime sponsor of that race. You can register to be a virtual participant or get more information at lung.org forward slash Radnor Run. So now we're ready to hear from our experts. Dr. Aditi Singh is a medical oncologist and assistant professor of medicine at Penn Medicine. She'll be discussing the challenges faced by lung cancer patients with COVID-19 and what is being done to ensure that patients can continue their treatments in a safe and timely manner. Dr. Singh, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you, Christy. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm Dr. Aditi Singh. I'm one of the medical oncologists here at Penn, and I have the honor of taking care of our lung cancer patients. Um, and today I'll briefly talk about um, lung cancer in the era of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, since the SARS-CoV-2 virus was discovered uh, back, in uh, back in December 2019 in China, there have been more than 5 million cases in the United States alone. And, and, and this disease has caused over 175,000 deaths in our country. This has created an unprecedented challenge for all healthcare systems across the world, um, including at Penn. Our lung cancer patients um, our lung cancer patients are a particularly unique and vulnerable population. And why is that? One is that a lot of our patients may be immunocompromised. So their immune systems are, not, are, are down because of certain treatments that they're getting. Their blood counts might be low. The next issue is that the symptoms of lung cancer and sometimes its treatments and the symptoms of COVID-19 can often overlap. So People can have the cough, shortness of breath, and this may result in misdiagnoses of lung cancer, especially during this time. The other thing is that we know that lung cancer patients who do get COVID, they don't seem to fare well. And how do we know that? I'll briefly talk about Teravolt, which is, our, which is a large international registry of over 26 countries of patients with lung cancer who also had confirmed COVID-19. The data on the first 400 patients enrolled was presented at this year's ASCO virtual meeting in June. And what did we, what did we learn from that? Sorry. We know that lung cancer patients are at higher risk for death from COVID-19. This is compared to the general population and also compared to other cancer types. Who are the patients who seem to be at particularly higher risk? These are patients that are older in age, patients who are more frail, or what we call have a poor performance status, or patients who are, getting, who are actively getting chemotherapy. We know that prevention is really the key here until we have a safe and effective vaccine. That being said, lung cancer itself is a life-threatening condition and its treatment just cannot wait. And this is why we're pulling out all stops to make sure our patients can continue their life-saving treatments while keeping them safe from the threat of COVID. What are we doing here at Penn Medicine? We created a set of multidisciplinary guidelines um, to help uh, not only people at, uh, not only our patients at Penn, but patients rolled around with lung cancer how to manage them during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic in the most evidence-based and effective manner. We had input from medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, our surgeons, and our interventional pulmonologists in helping draft these guidelines. What are we doing specifically to keep our patients safe? Our strategy is twofold. We wanna protect patients who need to come in to see us, to, who need to have contact with the healthcare system. And secondly, for patients where it's possible to limit contact with the healthcare system, we want to provide some, we want to deliver and provide their care as effectively as we can in the safety of their own home. So what are we doing for patients who are coming into the hospital? We're doing stringent symptom and temperature screening for anyone who walks in through the door. We are limiting visitors. 
wherever we think is appropriate or possible. We're strictly enfo enforcing that people wear and everyone, including employees and patients and visitors, wear their masks, wear their eye protection to keep everyone safe. We are testing all patients who are getting procedures coming through the emergency room or patients who are getting admitted. For patients where we are trying to limit contact in a safe way, um, where we're trying to avoid them coming into the hospital, we are offering routinely telemedicine visits. Um, we're trying to offer oral chemotherapy options for certain patients where it is a possibility. We're spacing out immunotherapy infusions um, to, to every four weeks or every six weeks, as opposed to every two or three weeks um, where we can safely do so. For some patients, we are even able to offer home infusions for certain treatment regimens. We are even offering lab draws at home for things like blood-based molecular testing, which some of you may know has become a cornerstone for managing lung cancer. And it's reassuring to know that the overall rate of our patients actually getting COVID has been extremely low. And most of, them ha most of this has been through community spread. I will end here with a quote from uh, my colleague in Italy, also one of our, um, also a lung cancer oncologist, Dr. Garasino. When asked about how are we going to get through this, her answer was with love for our patients, for our professions, and thanks to the sharing that has been created between us. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. We appreciate you sharing all that. I'm sure we're gonna have some questions from the audience. Um, but next we'll hear from Dr. Christoph Hutchinson. Dr. Hutchinson is the Pulmonary Medicine Director of Bronchoscopy at Pennsylvania Hospital and Assistant Professor of Clinical Medicine at Penn Medicine. He'll be providing an overview of interventional pulmonology, bronchoscopy, and the approach to diagnostic procedures and tissue staging during COVID. Dr. Hutchinson, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Christy. It's great to be here. Um, I'm Christoph Hutchinson. I'm one of the interventional pulmonologists here at Penn. And, um, you know, I want to talk a little bit about um, how uh, COVID affected my field. And I'll just share with you some slides. So interventional pulmonology, um, you know, some people may be familiar with it, but um, what it really is, is a field that uh, uses minimally invasive techniques like bronchoscopy, which um, I'll talk about, to uh, diagnose uh, many lung cancers. Um, we are a field that um, a lot of people will encounter when they first find a, a nodule or need a biopsy. Um, and a lot of the things that we do will diagnose uh, lung nodules as lung cancers or manage lung nodules or lung cancers early in the in the uh, phase of, of getting worked up for what, whatever you've been uh, sent to us for. Um, you know, bronchoscopy was affected particularly during this because it's a, a procedure that involves putting a camera on a scope down into your lungs. And obviously in order to do that, um, we need to make sure that we're not going to spread a, a respiratory virus around and to take care of our patients as safely but then also to make sure that we're not going to spread the um, virus to caregivers, to other people in the hospital. And so it was a real challenge early on, um, how, do we, how do we still offer what we do for our lung cancer and our lung nodule patients and those patients that need tissue to, to diagnose their cancers? Um, and how do we work around the, the need for bronchoscopy but keep people safe? And, one of the things that we've done at Penn is to ensure that we can now maintain the standard of care and bring our patients in safely and still get those procedures that they need because we're able to do testing before the procedures, just like Aditi talked about, because we're able to use uh, appropriate PPE. And I'll show you, you know, we're all wearing masks, N95s, respirators, uh, making sure that patients are screened. Um, and, you know, this has been a real important step because, you know, when this first happened, um, there were a lot of guidelines and, you know, one of the ones is the study that came from us, um, you know, what do we do at, to maintain, make sure people are getting their appropriate 
you know, working through the system in an appropriately uh, timely manner and getting their diagnoses, um, but minimizing the risk of getting a potentially deadly infection. So, you know, instituting the appropriate PPE, testing, uh, COVID testing before procedures, making sure we do temperature scans when folks come in. And, you know, we've been able to really ramp back up and, and, and maintain a, a very good standard of care. Some of the other things that, you know, we've been challenged with is, you know, people are afraid to come in just to, to, to the office or come in to get any procedure or do anything. And so telemedicine has really been something that Penn has uh, uh, rolled out to really make it, um, you know, so that you can stay home and still see, see your doctor. We can still talk about the images that you've been sent to, to us to review. Um, and we can still manage your lung nodules or even, you know, get you in for biopsies and see you at home first and, and only have you come in a limited amount of time. So, you know, that's, that's something that's really uh, moved forward uh, over the last few months. You know, we've been following all the national guidelines that our various societies have come out with, but, you know, because we're able to uh, institute all these safety practices, we're really able to maintain a, a good standard of care. Um, obviously, you know, wherever you're watching from may have, you know, different rates of COVID, um, the hospitals you're going to might be, you know, different, but, you know, speaking from our uh, experience, we've really been able to institute all the things that Aditi was referencing. Um, so with that, you know, I'll, I'll stop there and, and let other folks chime in. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Hutchinson. Dr. John Kaharchik is Chief of Thoracic Surgery at Penn Medicine. He's with us tonight to explain the precautions that the thoracic surgical teams are taking during COVID-19 to help alleviate some of the fear that our lung cancer patients might be having about their treatment. Dr. Kaharchik, thank you for being with us tonight. Sure, Christy, and it's great to have everybody join us. Um, you know, we made some tough decisions early on. I can remember back in um, March, the beginning of March, when both the state um, kind of mandated that most of the hospitals shut down elective procedures. Uh, we were called upon to decide whether lung cancer treatment was elective or not and not just surgically, but across all the specialties, uh, bronchoscopy and medical oncology. And um, I kind of, we had no data to make the decision on, but we made uh, kind of the argument that uh, lung cancer affects a lot of people. We know that lung cancers can be deadly unless they're treated appropriately and in a timely manner. And we really weren't quite sure about the COVID situation. We also didn't know how long the pandemic would last. Um, so we made the argument that um, we were willing to put ourselves at risk. Uh, we would do the best we could to lower the risk for each of our individual patients and their families and move forward. Um, and it turns out in retrospect, that was the right decision. Uh, there's been a number of publications since then. Uh, a lot of the information uh, for the Western world is coming out of Italy and a friend of ours, Dr. Andina, uh, published a big series about safely operating on about 300 and 25 lung cancer patients in Rome. Um, and we had a similar experience. Uh, we maintained our volume. We had no patients convert to COVID positive uh, in the perioperative period. That means from the time we first saw them to evaluate them till the time we got them through their operation and home and their post-operative visit. And uh, the way to do that is to, to be very careful in your screening, your patient selection, your preoperative COVID testing of the patient. And I will say that our health system had somewhat of a unique advantage because we have a lot of resources. So we could do our own in-house COVID testing with rapid turnaround. Um, we had a lot of uh, availability of, of protective uh, equipment and also a lot has been donated to us for which we were very, very thankful. Uh, so from, from a surgical perspective and, you know, kind of as a group, kind of leading the group forward, we were able to really uh, maintain the level of care that we provided uh, our lung cancer patients. And I would say that um, it was us and another small group of very aggressive cancers that really took charge and took over. Uh, and our colleagues in a lot of the other fields, um, some of which were more elective, kind of pitched in and helped take care of the COVID patients. So I think thinking about a DD slide, this really was an opportunity for all of us to come together. We shared information uh, across countries, not just across health systems in the Philadelphia area and then to allow us to continue to care for patients who had really significant diagnosis. Those physicians who did other things that may not, may be more elective and not as pressing, they took over and lifted the burden to care for the ICUs, to staff the ERs and those things. So 
actually was a very good um, kind of opportunity for all of us to show that we could do it. People ask me what the future holds, I'm not sure. I think that, um, I think certainly if we have another resurgence or a second wave, we know how to handle it. I think we'll continue on in the same light we are. Um, but, you know, as we move forward, uh, we have to always remember that uh, underlying lung dysfunction and lung cancers, those are really significant things. And, and sometimes you just have to really push forward with taking care of the things that you know will harm people uh, and try to do your best at containing things that you don't know much about, such as the pandemic. So I'll stop there. I'll be available. We can answer some questions and have some discussion afterwards. But thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaharchik. Dr. William Levin is Medical Director of Global Network Operations for Radiation Oncology and Associate Professor of Clinical Radiation Oncology for Penn Medicine. Dr. Levin will provide an overview of how radiation therapy is being handled at Penn Medicine during COVID, as well as the treatment of early stage lung cancer using radiation. He'll also share about proton therapy for the treatment of lung cancer. Dr. Levin, thank you so much for joining with us this evening. Great to be here, thanks for having me. So just to kind of follow up on, on what uh, the other three physicians had said, um, A, we, we were always open for business uh, in radiation oncology through COVID. We didn't have the luxury of kind of sitting out for a while and really strategically thinking about how should we you know, minimize risk and go forward. We were kind of you know, put in the fire and we, we embraced that. And you know we're tentative to begin with, and I think we were, in hindsight, probably I guess never really overly cautious, but we were quite cautious, cautious with each step uh, that we took along the way. And I think uh, we have a certain level of confidence now that um, that we kind of know how to operate um, on a daily basis. I think that um, given our size, and we are in fact one of the largest radiation oncology centers in the world. Uh, just at the main campus alone, we see over 200 patients. Um, we really had to be strategic uh, about how we move people through the system to minimize risk. Um, you know, to follow up, once, once folks come into the cancer center, there, are, there is thermal screening, um, those sorts of things, uh, protective devices in terms of masks. We actually, once people come into our department, we re, um, retest the temperature. Uh, everyone who comes into contact with a patient uh, has, um, who for more than 10 minutes or so, has to wear uh, eye protection as well as gloves. Uh, everyone who's going to receive treatment in our department is required to have a COVID test, um, and that, that needs to be done before the treatment uh, uh, begins. Now, if we have folks that we are uh, investigating actively whether they have active disease or if, if in fact there is someone that tests positive, um, each one of those uh, patients' cases uh, is uh, evaluated by uh, a committee staffed by three physicians and there's a determination made as to if that patient needs to be treated at that moment or can their treatment be delayed for a while. Um, clearly, we've had folks that needed to be treated, uh, so we really um, uh, developed and implemented uh, some very specific um, guidelines on how we would handle those folks. And basically, what it comes down to for the folks that we that are COVID positive or we suspect may be so, those patients are treated on a specific radiation machine. They're treated at the end of the day. Um, even before entering our department, uh, they are taken through corridors that have been vacated of any regular traffic. Uh, they're taken to the um, treatment room and then they're uh, taken out via that same uh, vacated uh, pathway. And then there's very strict um, hygiene uh, protocols in place to clean the room. And so, you know, we certainly have had patients there and, and, and we've done a great job of protecting the patients, the, the other patients that are there, as, as well as the staff and caregivers in the department. So I think that um, we, we really feel confident that, that we know how to, how to manage uh, large numbers of folks uh, that need to be seen in the department each day. In terms of our treatments, uh, again, being one of the largest and, and I would say one of the most technically technologically advanced centers in the world, uh, we have very specific equipment uh, and protocols for different types of lung cancer. 
uh, as, as some of you may know, in terms of the early stage lung cancers, which typically are smaller in size and do not involve lymph nodes, the standard of care for that treatment is surgery. And, uh, you know, we share a lot of folks with Dr. Kahar Chuck and his colleagues, uh, but some of those patients either opt to not have surgery or they, uh, it's not medically indicated. We don't think that um, uh, the risk uh, profile uh, it is uh, conducive uh, to having a successful surgery. So some of those folks come for radiation. And we have one particular uh, type of treatment that's known as SBRT, otherwise called stereotactic body radiotherapy. And with that particular technique, uh, we utilize certain heart, uh, um, equipment and software to administer large doses of radiation using multiple radiation fields to very small uh, tumors uh, with the um, uh, other uh, aim of avoiding the healthy tissue. That's a treatment that we can do on an outpatient basis. Uh, typically is done between four and five treatments. Um, and uh, we have a very high success rate. Uh, additionally, again, we're one of the most experienced centers in the country and in the world in utilizing that technique. Uh, the other thing that we have here at Penn that's quite unique is we do have a proton radiation center. Uh, there's probably less than 100 of these centers around the world, and uh, we are certainly considered one of the world leaders in the treatment of patients with proton radiation, as well as one of the world leaders in the education for other centers starting proton radiation. And that, again, utilizes a very uh, specific radiation beam to hit the target that you want to hit and minimize uh, the dose to the healthy tissues that are nearby. And so it's really beneficial for us to be able to minimize the side effects um, that take place when a lot of the healthy tissue is treated, again, which we want to avoid. It allows us to give the dose of radiation that we want to give, and it allows us to, uh, uh, to minimize a, a dose um, to the healthy tissue. And it also allows, uh, a, uh, the physicians like Dr. Singh to administer chemotherapy so that we can be very aggressive in our treatment. And uh, we, you know, typically at academic centers like ours, uh, we tend to be more aggressive on our treatment knowing how tough lung cancer is to be. Uh, so I'll take a, take a break there and um, thank you for having me. Thanks, Dr. Levin. Our final panelist this evening is Annette Eyer, National Assistant Vice President of Patient Engagement for the American Lung Association. Annette leads our grassroots patient advocacy efforts, working to ensure that patients struggling with lung disease have a voice in the public policy process at the state and local level. Annette will be highlighting the lung cancer programs and resources we have available. Annette, thanks for being with us this evening. Thank you, Christy, and thank you for inviting me to be a part of this program tonight. As we all know, um, lung cancer has been in the shadows for far too long, and our goal at the American Lung Association is to really lead that national conversation to educate the nation about the fact that anyone can get lung cancer. And as you mentioned earlier, we launched in 2014 our National Initiative Lung Force, which unites men and women across the nation to stand together to fight against lung cancer and for lung health. A diagnosis of lung cancer changes your entire world. And oftentimes patients are feeling very overwhelmed with the amount of information that's thrown at them, that's um, given to them. And, and they really find themselves saying, you know, just tell me what I need, where to go, who to trust. And, and that's what we're here to do. We are that trusted source of information for you. Um, a tool that it, we recently launched is our lung cancer navigator tool, which is our, on our website. And, and that basically lets you select wh which best describes where you are in your lung cancer journey. And you will be linked to the most important information that you need to get know and resources and guidance in that direction. But I will tell you our most valuable resources 
are our amazing lung force heroes. Those are the women and men who have lung cancer or caregivers who provide for those who have lung cancer. They are what inspires all of us. They encourage and empower us to raise our voices for those who can't speak for themselves. They encourage us to protect patients with pre-existing conditions and they encourage, help us encourage um, for um, early detection and advances in research for lung cancer treatment. And we invite all of you to join us um, in, our, in our efforts and become a Lung Force hero. And you can do that at um, lungforce.org. And all of our websites that we mentioned will be provided after, um, after the program. And we are committed to defeating lung cancer and supporting those affected by that disease. In addition to our lung, course, our lung cancer resources online, um, many of our lung cancer resource, resources were virtual before the pandemic, but now we, but we now more than ever, it is critical as an organization that we provide meaningful experiences for our patients to share their voice and their critical need that lung cancer patients are facing before and during and after this current COVID-19 pandemic. Our lung cancer survivor group online, which is um, hosted on inspire.com. We have over 113,000 lung cancer patients who are members worldwide. We find it so important to continue to host these safe support communities where lung cancer patients and caregivers caregivers are able to speak freely with trusted and supporting group members, and that can positively impact their mental health and make them not feel as isolated during this pandemic. Our newest partnership that we're very excited about was, is, is in 2019, we um, announced a partnership with Immerman's Angels. And Immerman's Angels is an organization that provides peer-to-peer um, -peer support for cancer patients. We are um, Immerman's Angels Lung Cancer Partner. So we work together to provide that peer-to-peer -peer support for individuals who have lung cancer. And it's a very simple process. Um, if you go to our website under lungcancer.org, forward slash care cancer um, hyphen mentor, you will be linked with someone who's a similar diagnosis, a similar age, and you can receive that one-on-one -on -one connection with someone who's going through the, the same diagnosis as you are. In addition, we have uh, the, their support for caregivers because that's a critical component to this, this journey is making sure that caregivers have the resources as well. Um, we have several of our lung force heroes who have gone through that process with Immerman Angels, Angels and now they've come back to provide that support for someone else. So you can receive support or you can be a mentor to someone else. And one of our, you know, very critical components of the work that we do is our lung helpline. And our lung helpline is 1-800-LUNG-USA. And it's staffed by nurses, respiratory therapists, and cessation counselors who can really help answer any medical questions that you may have. And, you know, as we mentioned before, our website is, is really the hub of all of our information. But in addition to our lung cancer resources and connections to our online support communities and our peer-to-peer -peer support, um, we really have been leading the charge um, with COVID-19 communications. And so we would invite you to go to our um, website and, and review our COVID-19 and lung cancer resources. That would be a great benefit for you. So I um, appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight and, and look forward to having any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Annette. So now is time remaining to answer questions from our audience. Remember, you can submit your question using the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and we have had some come in already. So I'll start with um, one. Um, I have one lung and my mask is three layers, but I'm finding it harder to breathe when wearing my mask. Is a two layer mask just as effective? So, um, would any of you doctors like to just jump in on this or I'm not sure exactly who to direct it to? I can take a stab at it. Um, you know, I guess the short answer is uh, three layers is better than two and two is better than one. Um, but, you know, uh, there's not a whole lot of data. There's a, there's a study, I think, in thorax that came out that looked at the different layers. And, um, but, you know, really, if you're having trouble with three and you're still socially isolated and you're maintaining your six foot distance and um, you find that three is a little cumbersome for you, you know, I think, you know, two for most people is going to be just fine. Um, you know, I, I think that that's a reasonable, a reasonable thing to change to. I, I don't know if anybody else has opinions on that, but I think 
I think it's a reasonable thing to, to, to go to a two layer mask, as long as you're, you know, following the, the basics of, um, you know, uh, your, your personal PPE and staying socially distant, you know, um, it's, it's, it should be fine. It's really about isolating the droplets and uh, a two layer mask should do, do plenty for you. That, that seems reassuring. Thank you. Anybody else have anything they want to share on that? Um, I, I, I agree um, with Chris. Um, I think um, like, you know, more layers is, is better, but two is, seems to be just fine as well. And the CDC does recommend that the, for the ones that are uh, sewn at home, they do recommend the two layer um, mask, um, you know, and, and in addition to what Chris mentioned, um, you know, obviously it's very important to maintain the social distancing, but you know, um, for to protect yourself completely, it's not just impo important that you're wearing your mask, but it's just as important that other people around you are wearing the appropriate masks. Um, so, um, and I would say that you know, the the masks that have these um, expiratory valves are not protective. They're actually letting people exhale air out, which is something that I don't think a lot of people are aware um, about. So I think. As long as you're wearing your two-layer mask, and as long as whoever you're interacting with um, or closer to you than six feet, they're wearing their mask, I think you should be fine. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Uh, another question came in, a similar question from two, two attendees, so I think this might be something on a lot of people's minds. Do you have any lung cancer patients who are positive for COVID-19, and how are you handling their treatment? Um, I can I can take a stab at this. Um, uh, we do uh, we do have some patients um, that did test positive for COVID. Um, not a lot, um, thankfully. Um, you know, there's in terms of treatment. Um, we uh, in terms of their cancer specific treatment, we would not give them chemotherapy in that case because just like if you had a pneumonia or you had an any any other infection, we don't want to give you chemotherapy, which could potentially hamper your infection fighting skills. So we would hold um, your treatments, your chemotherapy treatment until you get better or the patient got you know, recovered. Um, you know, unfortunately, we are not quite there yet where we have a standard treatment for COVID. Um, and so it's more supportive care. So a lot of patients were still able to manage at home because they don't, even though they have COVID, they don't get terribly sick. For the patients who do get sick or need additional oxygen or, you know, God forbid, a, uh, a ventilator, then, you know, they're managed like every other COVID patient in, in the hospital, where they might get a combination of some kind of, um, you know, in, in, in addition to oxygen, they may need um, steroids if they're sick, or they may need, um, we may give them an, anti uh, an antiviral or a monoclonal antibody, really, you know, uh, all these things in our arsenal that we think are effective, but we don't really have any clear guidelines in terms of what one specific thing works. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't think that would be different um, whether you have lung cancer or not. Thank you. Would anybody else like to say anything more about that? Okay. Um, can, here's another question. Can you speak on tumor glow usage in surgery? Dr. Kaharchik, is that for you? Sure. Um, so, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Sunil Singal, who is both a thoracic surgeon and a very prolific researcher, has developed some uh, techniques where we can give an intravenous drug before surgery, uh, then travels towards your body and it tracks to your tumor and attaches to it with some antibodies. And if we shine a certain wavelength of light at it, it will make the tumor glow. Uh, this technology is currently under investigation. Um, it's part of a we started it here, but it's now becoming part of a, of a uh, national trial, multi-institutional national trial. And it's really used for us to try to do two things. One is to try to identify smaller nodules that we can't get to because they, we can't feel them. They're too small or in too difficult of a place to stick a needle in them. Uh, the, the guys can't get it with bronchoscopy. So it's a technique to try to localize those very small tumors. It can also be used to screen the rest of the lung um, when you're taking a big tumor out to make sure there are no tumorlets somewhere else in the lung. 
So it's currently under investigation. We're actively enrolling patients. Uh, it doesn't make sense for everybody, um, but it does help or seem to help in a, in a certain number of patients. And so it's the kind of the focus of some ongoing research and study. Um, it turns out it's very good at predicting lung cancers in the operating room. Uh, we compared it to predicting based on the, the glow patterns, whether it was a lung cancer, and then took it upstairs to the laboratory and had the pathologist looked at it. And the concordance was perfect. So it was just as good as somebody looking at the, the cells under a microscope. Uh, so it does have some promise. It's only for certain types of lung cancer, um, and we're actively pursuing it at the moment. Thank you, Dr. Koharczyk. Um, we have a couple questions from a woman who's a five-year lung cancer survivor. So I'm going to start with this one. What medications are currently being used to treat the virus? I've read so much about the drug hydroxychloroquine and the positive effects it can have if treated early. Do the doctors share this view? Does the right to try apply to this drug, even if against doctor recommendation? Who would like to take to take a stab at that? This is this, I'll take a stab at it because this is more of a political question than a medical question. Um, so right to try does not give a patient the, the right to compel me to give them something, um, but it does allow them if I think it's a good idea and you're willing to try something that may have benefit but is outside of a clinical trial, it's not proven yet, uh, that is a, a, a way around getting uh, through the regulations so the FDA doesn't stop us from doing it. You basically agree to be a guinea pig. I basically say, I think this could help you. We're both in a dire situation. Let's try it. So yes, I think the right to try has made some, um, uh, some impact on this. Um, the chloroquine story is all over the place. I think the majority of people would agree that it is not helpful. Um, but you know, you hear anecdotal tales and stories all the time. Um, I think that the convalescent plasma, which was just emergency approved, um, certainly has had and shown efficacy in other types of diseases that are similar uh, to this. And so I think there's probably something there. They short circuited the approval process a little bit, which is why it's in the news and some people are happy and some people are upset. Um, from the scientific perspective, I would say most people would say it has great promise, but nobody's 100% certain. Um, the thing that probably has the most promise in treating patients who have an active infection that has gotten out of control and is now in the life-threatening stages are some of the antiviral drugs. Um, some of these are from the AIDS community um, and other uh, diseases that are treated with some pretty heavy duty um, immunosuppressive and antiviral agents. I think those probably have the most promise for treatment. Uh, and then everybody's holding out to see what comes next. Um, so I think, yes, I think that overall, the right to try might be a good thing. The uh, problem with all these is everybody is very concerned about them being abused and patients being, you know, experimented on when it's not appropriate. But I think in some situations, um, if uh, the patient and the doctor agree and there are no other kind of proven studies, I think that there's some value there. But again, that's really become more of a political hot potato than it has become a, a medical question. Thanks, Dr. Kaharchik. Um, yeah, if I could just yeah. add a couple of cents too. I, I, um, I spent a significant amount of time in the ICU taking care of some of these patients um, over the last several months. And, um, you know, I, I totally agree. I think, you know, the, it evolved so quickly, um, you know, when, when everything started, you know, we were putting a lot of people on hydroxychloroquine because, you know, it came out of China. That was what they were doing. And we kind of followed that. And, you know, very quickly we found that it, um, really wasn't doing a whole lot. And, uh, you know, the, um, you know, we have a treatment algorithm here. And so at first it was, if you were hospitalized, you know, we were starting you on hydroxychloroquine and, and going with that. And then, you know, as we found, you got in the ICU, we'd add, you know, um, a steroid. Um, and it, or initially we didn't know which one to use. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot of data. So, um, it was very challenging, uh, to know, what to do initially. And I think, um, you know, based off of we were, you know, doing conference calls with Italy or doing, you know, seeing what the Chinese had done. And, um, you know, the, the buzz about hydroxychloroquine, particularly because our political leadership was really pushing it, I think, 
Um, you know, it's a, it's a drug that works well for some autoimmune conditions, but it also has a lot of side effects, particularly with, um, you know, heart arrhythmias and um, you have to really be careful about what other drugs patients are on. Um, and so, you know, I don't think a right to try an unproven, we don't have enough data to show it in that particular drug um, that it really does anything. And, you know, the, the patients that I saw, I had plenty of people that ended up, you know, under my care in the ICU that had been on hydroxychloroquine for weeks and it didn't do anything. And, and um, so I would say that it, uh, I totally agree, it's a, a much more political uh, hot potato than it is a, 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 a real therapy that you have a, a, an interest that's gonna make a difference uh, in, your, in your overall outcome. You know, the steroid dexamethasone uh, for really sick patients um, in the ICU has shown that it, you know, works a lot better than, than hydroxychloroquine ever did. Um, and so, you know, a lot of the supportive care that we did for patients is really, you know, having them lay on their stomach, um, you know, get, give them supplemental oxygen was really a big intervention. And then just, you know, stuff that we already were doing, you know, um, critical care that we had known for years had worked. Uh, once we got comfortable knowing that those interventions worked is what we did. You know, it was a lot of the, a lot of the bread and butter critical care that we knew how to do. And then once the immunologic therapies came out, we could give those um, working together with our infectious disease colleagues and following, you know, evidence-based guidelines, um, you know, we really could make a difference. But, um, you know, there, there is no magic bullet for it. And I, and I, I don't think there's anything that, that you can just say that there's a right to, to try it. I think if you were critically ill on a ventilator and you're needing a lot of support at that point is when we start to pull out all the stops and trying things. But, you know, other than that, I, I, I don't think it's necessary. Thank you. Um, okay, so, so the follow-up from uh, the woman who's a five-year lung cancer survivor was asking about the current treatment for COVID, which I think you've already touched on, um, and I'm, I'm assuming this is particularly for lung cancer patients. Um, and also, uh, she's asking, do, does someone need a referral to come to Penn for treatment if they suspect they have the virus? I don't, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think a lot of the people come through the emergency room or directly referred by their primary care provider. Mm -hmm. So no, if somebody develops uh, increasing shortness of breath and thinks they have the virus, they should probably put a mask on, they go through the ER, they get segregated, they get tested, and you make sure that it is COVID that's causing their problem. And in the current environment, the likelihood is there's probably something else going on. Um, and so it's important to know what that is and to try to treat it. But um, for emergency care, no, you never need a referral. Um, for just routine outpatient care, you'd probably go through your primary care doctor. Uh, and then if there was some expertise that we offered at Penn Medicine, it's very easy for people to get in and get seen relatively quickly. Okay, thank you. I think this next question is probably for you as well, Dr. Koharczyk. What are the risks for COVID complications for a 73-year-old woman who never smoked and is in good health other than having a right lower lobe wedge resection, left lower lobe lobectomy? Cancer was removed at the early stage and no other treatments involved, no chemo, radiation, or immunotherapy after surgery. Do you have anything you can share well, with her? Yes, I mean, your, her, her biggest risk is her age and, and age and overall health does play a big role in um, how you do with COVID. The unpredictable thing is how a patient reacts. So there are some people, they tend to be younger, but not always, who are relatively asymptomatic. And there are other people who have a um, really a rip-roaring uh, inflammatory reaction that includes really two things. One is pneumonia. And certainly anyone that has had portions of their lung removed you know, your lung does not grow back. So you are at some increased risk, you have less lung. So if your pneumonia progresses faster and you have less lung, obviously you could potentially get into more difficulty. The other complication with COVID that we didn't recognize at the onset, it was recognized by criti critical care guys like Hutchinson later on was that there's a clotting disorder and there's a lot of microclots that develop. And so now actually sometimes people are really aggressively anticoagulated. But I think, um, I think that 
number one is your age puts you at the highest risk. Having had prior lung surgery, yes, it just makes common sense that you would be at increased risk if you got a very severe and significant case of COVID pneumonia. The problem is we don't know how you're going to react. There are people trying to figure out what's, what, what is the genetic difference? What is the phenotypic, the, the how our genes are expressed as people? What's the difference between all of us? Why do some of us get this terrible disease, end up on a ventilator? Why do some of us die from it? And others, you know, get a casual kind of flu-like thing. They may get some anosmia. They may lose their sense of smell and taste. And yet they're fine. There's even some people who are asymptomatic spreaders. Uh, so they test positive, but they're never actually sick. Um, so there's obviously a lot that is unknown about it. Um, and that's why the best advice is probably the advice that Dr. Singh gave early on. Um, so, you know, if you're uh, 73, you should be wearing a mask. You should be socially distancing. The grandkids should be out in the yard. And part of it is because, you know, they have a lot of contacts that you can't control. So there's multiple ways that virus could get to you. Um, and I think that if you've had a prior lobectomy, although we can't calculate what the risk is, instinctually, we think it's a little bit higher. So I think you should be as careful as other people. So I don't think there's anything particular about being 73 and having a lobectomy, but I do think it makes sense. It probably is a slightly higher risk than all the other 73 year olds who are exactly like you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We, we're, we have a couple more questions in the queue that I would love to ask if, if you are all okay with sticking around for a few more minutes. Um, I know we were hoping to wrap up a little bit earlier, but um, the next question is, um, when would you advise patients to get the COVID vaccine? Will you be recommending it once there's data? Well, we have to see what the data is first. <laughs> so that's also, you know, um, we interact because of where we are, we interact with all kinds of people, uh, immunologists, uh, transplant people who have an interest in it, virologists who obviously have an interest in, in viruses, uh, and infectious disease physicians who are like academic infectious disease physicians. So they're interested in public policy and all those things. And um, there's real debate as to whether or not an effective vaccine will de be developed and if it is developed, when that will be. I think the important thing is similar to the question before is we need to keep the politics on both sides out of it and we need to just stick with the science. Um, and so far people have really uh, done a good job of doing that. What I will say is that if there's convincing evidence, um, I would think that we would re recommend it to almost everybody um, in a similar fashion, especially in our patients that are older and in our healthcare providers that we recommend uh, yearly flu vaccines. So I think once the data is there and compelling, yes, it will be recommended. The, the Achilles heel will be, you know, can they develop an effective vaccine? And if so, when will that occur? And those are two things that lots of people want to predict and prognosticate on, but unfortunately, no one knows. And in our current culture, the thing we hate the most is unknown. That creates a lot of anxiety. But for right now, we just kind of have to live with it and we have to see where we end up in the next few months. Thank you. Um, the next question was, I have one lung. A coworker just came back from the Dominican Republic. Should I continue to work or take time off? I don't think she was tested and she isn't quarantining. I'm going to take this one because this sounds like the daily conversation that I have with my mother, <laughs> my 80 year old mother. And, and, it, and you don't have to go to medical school to give this advice. But the, the advice is the same on, uh, and, and it is, is, there, is this something you really have to do? And you have to remember, even though we were uh, given lovely introductions and called experts and so forth, I think everyone uh, who's on this panel has made clear that no one really knows what's going on with this virus. That's the God's honest truth. And anyone that says they do clearly uh, isn't based in reality. So that's the answer I give to my mother. That's the answer that I give to my wife in regard to my little children. Is it something you really have to do? Um, and it's that simple. Not do you want to do it. Would you feel like you're missing out? And my mother called me yesterday and she said, well, her girlfriends in the pool want her to come down to the pool. 
do you really have to do it? And, and look, if um, odds are, you know, that, that not everyone's going to get, a, like John said, the rip roaring um, illness that we're all afraid of. But you don't want to be that, that person in the minority that gets it, you know. So um, that's really the advice that I'm dispensing because uh, we, we don't have any, any more knowledge than, than most of you guys. And, and that's the rule that I would live by. If you don't have to go to work or you work from home uh, or you do have the time off, that's probably what, if, if it's crossed your mind. So th that's kind of where I think my answer would lead. Yeah, I would just echo Bill. And, and one of the things I would say as a university, as an institution, all us as healthcare workers, um, we have, we're not allowed to travel uh, up through, well, they've decided up through December 31st. Uh, we're not sure what will happen after then, but, um, you know, we would go to medical meetings and we would travel and give lectures and talks. All that has been suspended. Um, if you go to a certain area, when you return, you're expected to quarantine for 14 days on your own time in order to pr protect your patients and your fellow coworkers. Um, so I'm surprised. I don't, I don't know what the current travel status is from Costa Rica to, to Philadelphia. Uh, um, I guess I'm a little surprised that even your employer uh, doesn't enforce a, a quarantine on that that person um, for 14 days. I don't know, Bill, do you want to comment? Aren't, aren't most, like, we can't really travel. Um, yeah, I mean, that that's the thing. And, and it, what John says is, that, yeah, we, we're, we're very restricted, completely restricted. And um, I think we're all going a little stir crazy. And um, we, we realize that generally we have it pretty good. And and we get to, you know, to see the world um, on a fairly regular basis. But, um, you know, the, what John is alluding to also is what I remind people, you know, you can be the best about protecting yourself. And it's what Aditi and Chris were talking about. You can wear your mask, but if the other person isn't wearing their mask or you don't know where that, where they've been, that clearly puts you at risk. So, um, you know, you, you have to understand that you're you're one person in a world of many, and and again, uh, it's impossible to know what everyone else has been doing. So I, I I would say, you know, very simply, better safe than sorry if you can avoid a situation that that may be um, associated with some increased risk. Thank you. I think that's really helpful advice and. Um, I think that um, we've gone through, we, we do see some, oh, I do see one more. Do most lung cancer patients with COVID end up in the hospital for treatment? Um, from my perspective, well, from a surgical perspective, if you have active COVID, we don't operate on you. And we have not had anybody uh, convert post-surgery. Uh, so for that perspective, I would say no. Um, it'd be interesting. I don't actually have that data or could answer that question. That's an interesting question that probably we could pull. How many patients who are in the hospital with COVID have a history of lung cancer and how long ago was their lung cancer? Um, but nobody's looked at that. Uh, so I can't really answer that. Aditi, I don't know if you want to take a shot at that, but in general, um, yeah. we're not. I, yeah, I would say that, um, not necessarily. I think, um, again, you know, it depends really on on all those things that I mentioned before, your age, your, you know, how fit you are and are you actively getting treatment for lung cancer or is this a cancer that happened, um, you know, you're cancer free for five years. Um, and I think um, interestingly in the terrible registry, the rate of ICU admissions was actually low. It was 8%. Um, so, you know, there's a lot to, you know, there's this data is, is getting going to get more mature. They're going to have an update in September at the ESMO meeting where they'll talk about the first 1,000 patients and we'll get a le little bit better sense of, of, you know, we know that people don't, you know, who get it don't necessarily do well and those are the higher risk people with lung cancer, but, you know, are they, are they, are most of them getting admitted to the hospital? I, I, I'm not sure. I would imagine the ones that don't do well do get admitted, but this could also be a little bit of a skewed database because these are big academic centers that are 
in putting patients in, and it's possible that the vast majority of patients, just like patients that don't have lung cancer, we don't know about because they're at home, either quarantining or they never got tested. Um, but I would say that, you know, not necessarily is the short answer. Well, this has been so informative. I wish we could keep going, but I want to be thoughtful to all of your time that you all are donating so generously. We do have some thank you notes from some of your some of our attendees. Someone saying they want to thank Dr. Levin and Dr. Singh. They treated my husband two years ago and gave him extra life. A note to Dr. Harchik and his team. Um, I'm almost five years cancer free, um, thanks to you. So. Um, I hope you, uh, our doctors at Penn Medicine, know how grateful we are for your expertise, for the way that you're working on the front lines to care for all of us. And so we thank you for your time. Thank you to Annette for all the work you do to advocate for our lung cancer patients um, and provide resources. And thanks to all of you attendees for giving of your time tonight. We hope this was helpful. If we didn't get to your question, we will follow up with an email with the answers from the doctors um, and, and Annette on, on what you asked. But thanks to all of you for being here tonight. We hope you have a wonderful evening. Please Thank look you. out for our survey. We'll be sending Bye. one. In. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.